Final lesson in our unit on one variable statistics. And what we're looking at today are measures of relative position. And last, last lesson we looked at dispersion and measures of spread. And really we introduced variance and standard deviation. But there are other measures of dispersion and they're called the measures of relative position. And it describes the portion of data below a certain point. So where the measures of spread and the measures of really dispersion, which is standard deviation, dealt very closely with the mean, the measures of relative position have a lot to do with medians. And it's kind of like measures of dispersion as related to the median. And we'll begin by looking at quartiles and the interquartile range. So quartiles divide a set of ordered data into four groups with an equal number of values. So it's similar to how the median divides data into two groups, right? Those that are above the median, those that are below the median. Quartiles divide data into four groups. The interquartile range is the range of the middle half of the data. And so we can see in the diagram here, we've got this, we've got this spread from the highest data point, the highest datum, to the lowest datum. And evenly distributed throughout these is the first quartile, Q1, the median, which is often called Q2, and the third quartile, which is called Q3. And the injured quartile range is really a range of data between Q3 and Q1. Right? The larger the inter interquartile range, the larger the spread of the data. A box and whisker plot and a modified box and whisker plot illustrate quartiles and interquartile range. Really, these are diagrams that represent um, that represent the quartile description of spread. So if a point is outside, um, basically we, we take Q1 minus 1.5 times the interquartile range, or Q3 plus 1.5 times the interquartile range, this is how we classify a data point as an outlier. Okay, so really um, what we're going to look at is what a box and whisker plot happens to look like. And so for any given set of data, this is what we have. And you can see why it's called a box and whisker plot. We have um, the box, which is bound by Q1 and Q2 and Q3, right? We've indicated Q2 as the, as the median, uh, which is just M. And the whiskers extend to the lowest data point and the highest data point. Okay, and so in a real data set, we would, of course, have numbers that would represent Q1 and Q3, and then a number that would represent the median. And a modified box in whisker plot really is exactly the same thing, it's just that it shows outliers. Okay, so in, in say, in a different data set, this is what we'd have. We'd have the lowest datum, the highest datum, and then we'd have two outliers. And those outliers are really classified as Q1 minus the intercourt 1.5 times the interquartile range, or Q3 plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. And of course, we'd have to check if, if we suspect that something might be an outlier, then we check it against this value, Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. And if indeed the data is greater than that value, then it's an outlier. So here's example one. A random survey of 15 people walking into the school were asked how many times they've attended a live concert. And these are the results. Determine the median, the first and third quartiles, the interquartile range, and any outliers. And then draw a, a modified box and whisker plot. So, of course, when we have 
data that we're looking at the median, we have to organize it into an ordered list. And so here's our ordered list from lowest to highest. <clears throat> the median in this group, if we count inwards, the middle value is 4. So the median of this group is 4. And then we take the lower range and the higher range and we determine the first and third quartiles. Okay, So here's the median and now we've drawn these dashed lines and this kind of gives us the lower and the upper half of the data. So 1, this value 1, this is Q1 and that's the median of the lower half of the data. Q3 is the median of the higher half of the data. Okay, so Q1 in this case equals 1. Q3 is 8 because it's the median of the, up, of the upper half of the data. So we need to determine then, okay, 35. This looks pretty suspect. Is this in fact an outlier? And it is because we can actually determine the interquartile range is 7 and we would then compare 35 to our little formula for what an outlier is and of course Q3 which is 8 plus 1.5 times 7 which is the interquartile range and that value is is lower than 35 so 35 is an outlier so here's the interquartile range right here and of course it's 7 and we can determine that that is a, an outlier. Percentiles are very similar to quartiles except that they divide the sets of data into a percentage so you could think of them like quartiles but they divide data sets into a hundred intervals with equal numbers of values. Percentiles have very confusing notation that come along with them. So let's, before we begin looking at percentiles, we need to define a few variables. Percentiles are always labeled as P sub K. And so P sub K is an actual item of data, and it's called the Kth percentile. So P90 would be the 90th percentile. In any particular set of data, K percent of the data is less than or equal to the value of PK. So if we're looking at the 90th percentile, then 90% of the data is less than or equal to the value of PK. And again, we need to remember that we always need to place data in numerical order when we're working with percentiles. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that P80 would have 80% of the data less than or equal to the value of P80 and then 20% of the data is greater than or equal to the value of P80. And to find what that is, we multiply 0 0.8, which is that percentage that's lower than, by n. And n is, of course, the number of items, of data, of, of, of datum, that are in this sample. So this data point and the one above it, and, and all the ones above it, right, are basically are um, greater than the 80th percentile. Okay. Percentiles are easy when you have more than 100 pieces of data. Where percentiles become very difficult is when you have less than 100 pieces of data that you're trying to divide into 100 intervals. Because when you think about that, oh, you know, that can be very tricky, dividing less than 100 data points into 100 intervals it can be very, very confusing. So we're going to look at an example. And so this given this set of data right here, which is 40 students, right? And it summarizes their exam scores for one section of Statistics 101 at UW. And, of course, they all are arranged in order from 34 all the way to 99. 
And so the question is, okay, what's the 90th percentile of this data point, of this data set? And we're going to go through how to do this now because it's, um, it's pretty simple when you see the approach that we take. The 90th percentile is, of course, the boundary between the lower 90% and the upper 10%. But we need to determine, in terms of these 40 scores, where that boundary exists. And so we take 90%, which is 0 0.9, times the 40 scores. So it means here, of course, 90 times uh, 0 0.9 times 40 is 36. So it means the boundary between the lower 90% and the upper 10% is that 36th score. Right? So with 40 datum, this number falls in between the 36th and the 37th data points, which happens to be between 89 and 91. And so what we could say then is P90 then is right in between these two data points. 89 plus 91 divided by 2, and the 90th percentile happens to be a mark of 90. Okay, Now, of course, it won't always work out that P90 equals 90. Um, it just happens to be for this example. So now another question could be, does a certain student score of 75% place them at the 70th percentile? Or are they above it or are they below it? So what we can say is the 70th percentile is found between the lower 70 and the upper 30%. And so we can say, okay, well, 0 times 7, 0 0.7 times 40 is 28. So it'll be in between the 28th and the 29th data points. And so where are these data points? Well, between 76 and 78. So that's the boundary between the, the, the bottom 70 and the upper 30. And of course, what that is, if you take the midpoint between 76 and 78, that's of course 77%. So when we compare a, an individual student score of 75%, that doesn't place them at the 70th percentile. In this data set, that would place them below the 70th percentile. So this is a very good way for individuals to compare where they stand relative to everyone else in a group of people. Right? And this is very often why percentiles are used, especially when it comes to really big sets of marks. So for example, the SATs or the AP exams in the United States of America and in Canada are massive, massive standardized tests. And very often a student will be very interested in where they stand relative to everyone else in the country. And of course, if you have a mark on the SATs that's above the 90th percentile, it means that 90% of the students in the United States scored lower than you did. Right? And so this is a very powerful measure because if you happen to be a student, that's at, say, the 95th percentile. It means you have scored better or equal to 95% of students in the country.